Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the ENT emergencies for the IENT module. Um, this is one of my original lectures that I made all the way back in 2019. So you can see that a lot of the pictures are a little bit older, or you may be familiar with them already. Um, and I apologize, I haven't had time to redo this lecture in a long while, but it will be something that is on my list for next year. All of that being said, um, ENT emergencies is a topic that I want you guys to kind of pay particular attention to if you're working in the emergency department, because even though ENT emergencies aren't quite as sexy as the trauma emergencies or the eye emergencies, we see ear, nose, and throat emergencies probably on a daily basis, especially if you're working in an urgent care or a fast track. These tend to be a lot of the common stuff. And a lot of the big emergencies or the things that can't be missed are things that are often looked over. And so um, we'll see this on a constant basis. And I definitely think it's worthwhile to pay attention to not just the emergencies, but also the commons. So let's go ahead and get this started. Um, first thing about uh, ENT or otolaryngology consults is at heart, these folks, while we love them, they're surgeons. And so if you're going to be consulting the ear, nose and throat doctor, or if you're deciding whether they need a consult, you need to understand that when you're presenting to them, they want to hear what they can do about your patient. So they don't wanna hear what the problem is or what your guess is, they want to hear what it is they can do. Do they need to take this patient to surgery right now? Or is this something they can follow up in clinic later? A lot of otolaryngologists are going to question you over the phone. They're very well versed in kind of the terse responses and asking you what you have already tried to fix the problem. So they're going to ask you if you've tried medications, if you've tried reducing it or draining it yourself, that kind of thing. So please always, if you're going to do an otolaryngologist or an ENT consult, try to do something first before you're going straight in to do the consult. I also want you to be aware that in the emergency department, at least in the United States, there's a lot of complicated turf battles about which person is the correct service to consult. So ear, nose, and throat, obviously, if it's in the ear, nose, or throat, it's going to be ENT. But for example, facial trauma is often shared with plastics. So sometimes the ENT doctors will be on call and sometimes it's going to be the plastics doctors on call. So especially if you're working in an academic center or a big trauma one, it's really important to ask your charge nurse or ask your colleagues, hey, I have this problem, which service do I consult for what? The next big thing um, that is a complicated common turf battle is esophageal problems. Typically, if it's above the vallecula and higher, it's usually ear, nose, and throat. Whereas if it's below the vallecula, right, then that means it's actually in the esophagus itself. It might be GI. And especially when we talk about foreign bodies that are stuck in the esophagus, you're gonna notice that the ear, nose and throat doctors are not the folks to call once it's beyond a certain point. So definitely always ask whether this is a good consult for ear, nose and throat or plastics or ear, nose and throat in GI. All right, so I wanna start out, instead of just talking about just the ear, the nose and the throat, I wanna talk about some overall facial emergencies just to kind of get those things out of the way. So I wanna talk about some fractures, I wanna talk about dental injuries, and I wanna talk about facial droop and facial swelling. So to start off with, facial fractures are probably one of the most common things that we see in the emergency department that are considered minor trauma. Notice that there is an abnormally large proportion of these facial traumas that are all nasal fractures, like almost half. That's an insane amount of nasal fractures. It's also really important for you to know that when a nasal fracture has happened, we're not really doing anything about a nose fracture. Even if you have a bloody nose, 
we try to stop the bloody nose, but we have to be very careful about packing nasal fractures and that kind of stuff. So I just want to make sure you know that most nasal fractures, especially when left alone, will stop bleeding. And unless it's a very complex one with multiple other facial fractures, we don't do anything in the emergency department for a nasal fracture. Now, don't worry, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later on. But I also want you to be aware that most dental fractures are going to need a dentist later. Hopefully that is obvious for you guys. Um, and then any kind of orbital fracture. Remember that most of these fractures, I'm talking about isolated fracture. So somebody gets hit in the face and they have an isolated orbital fracture, or they fall down the stairs and they just have a nasal fracture. If it's just that one fracture, we do nothing. Okay. If it's multiple fractures, that's a different story. And we're going to talk about that here in the next slide. I also want to make sure you guys are aware that the best imaging, if you're suspicious of a facial fracture, is a CT maxillofacial without contrast. And we're doing it without contrast because we're just looking at the bones. We're not looking at the swelling. We're not worried about tumors or infection. We're just looking at whether the bones are broken. If you do a head CT, that is specifically looking inside the cranium for a skull fracture, not a face fracture, and you will miss a good portion of the lower half of the face if you do a CT head. So be sure to think about the differences between those. Um, and I also want to mention that facial fractures almost always come in the primary survey when we're doing trauma even though we don't do a whole lot about facial fractures. The main reason is because of fractures like this. This is one of the worst facial fractures you can have. It's named. It's called the Lafort fractures, and there's three different types. You notice that they're a very handy picture right here on the screen, and you can have um, a Lafort fracture type one. And what that's doing is you can see that the bottom half of the maxilla or right below the nose, th the teeth and the maxilla itself are no longer attached to the skull. You can see the picture of the young woman below with just a bare minimum cut right above her upper lip. Even though she doesn't look like it, she has a Lafort fracture one. Now, a Lafort fracture two means that it's not just the, the teeth and the bones that are holding in the teeth, it also involves the nose. Even though you can't see that in this picture, if you were to pick up this gentleman's nose and move it around, you would see that it moves separate to the rest of his face. And then a Lafort fracture number three is probably one of the worst, and it's involving the orbits. So it's the whole lower half of the face. Now, I want you to notice that this gentleman, this Indian gentleman down here below that's got a Lafort three fracture is still conscious and awake. For all you know, he may actually be talking. So if you're seeing somebody who is, say, in an altercation and you see obvious facial damage, it's always important to put your fingers on their face and kind of wiggle their nose or um, check out their cheekbones and their orbits and that kind of stuff because... These fractures can be really serious, and when you encounter them in real patient life, they're not always as obvious as you would think they would be. All of these fractures all deserve trauma transfer, so a real Lafort fracture is always going to be an emergency. This is always a big deal. This is always an admission, and these can be pretty ugly. The reason why we care about these in the primary survey is because of problems like this. This gentleman has a Lafort fracture, and you can see that he is bleeding from the nose and the mouth. And what you can't see from this picture, because it's not a video, is that because the top half of the skull is unstable, intubating him is almost impossible. And you can see how much blood he's bleeding, which he's hooked up to suction. 
this is not a patient that you would want to lay flat to asphyxiate on his own blood or a patient that you would want to go ahead and nasally intubate. Most of these Lafort fractures are always a big airway issue and you want to call anesthesia. Even your attending is going to call anesthesia because these can be very tricky and often end up in criking. So you should be aware of what the Lafort fracture is and how easy they are to miss if you don't think about doing the exam. Now let's move on to dental basics. I realize that you did not go to dentistry school and no, I did not get confused, but you have to understand that most of our patients don't know the difference between the ER and going to a dentist. They think that we know everything and can fix everything. And so they come to us for their dental problems, especially when it involves trauma. So I wanted to bring up a couple of things. There are three layers to your teeth. You see the very topmost layer called the enamel. And the enamel is what we most typically notice because you need to do a teeth whitening or you need to brush your teeth and that kind of stuff. There's another layer below that called the dentin. The dentin is actually cushion for your teeth to allow us to bite into objects. And then the last is the pulp. And pulp is the neurovascular component of the tooth. That's where the blood and the nerves are. So if you have a fracture as shown here, where you can see the pulp, this is almost always painful and has direct access to both nerve and blood vessel. Now, before we go too much into that, I need to mention just a couple of other vocabulary terms, and that is the labeling of the teeth. You can see here if we're talking about a molar versus an incisor versus a canine. Canine are the little sharp pointy eye teeth that are maybe the vampire teeth, and they're in the, both the bottom and the top. So if you're talking about a canine, it's a very specific tooth. Make sure you know that terminology. And you also should know the terminology molar. And I think that most dentists are okay with you not trying to count the molars, but it's important to know whether it's an incisor tooth, which is the front teeth, a canine or a molar. And the last sort of dental basic I really want to teach you before we get into some of this trauma is that the baby teeth typically all are adult teeth by 12 years old. So if a kid comes in who's under 12, who has a bunch of dental problems, or maybe one of the teeth fell out because he fell off a bunk bed or something like that, we're not as worried about it because he's going to grow some adult teeth. He or she are going to grow adult teeth. So typically we start kind of worrying a lot more if they have adult teeth versus baby teeth trauma. So now let's talk about some of these dental fractures and injuries. So you can see up here the main um, chart. Um, we have a different classification for dental fractures. So that is called the Ellis classification. So Ellis classification is just one, two, and three. And it's in such an easy way and pattern that you can recognize. Interestingly enough, I've spoken to several dentists um, on call and several of the dentists aren't familiar with the Ellis classification. So I'm not sure, but I know that medically, we always talk about Ellis classifications, but dentally, I guess they don't anymore, or maybe only some schools teach it. But I do think that you need to know the Ellis classification. So an Ellis one is just a regular old enamel fracture. It's usually just a little chipped tooth. And while maybe worth noting, it's also not going to usually cause the patient a whole lot of pain and it's just more of a cosmetic fix. So we kind of ignore Ellis class one fractures. Ellis class two fractures are going to be an exposure of the dentin. And no matter how yellow this person's teeth are, you will see a difference between the enamel and the dentin. Dentin always looks a lot more yellowed than the surrounding enamel, especially if the fracture is fresh. And then the last Ellis classification fracture is the Ellis class three. And that was the picture from the previous slide. And it's also exposed here. That is exposed pulp. And these Ellis class three fractures are usually very sensitive to hot and cold liquids or even air. Ellis class three, usually we do um, a, a quick, easy treatment in my recommendation. 
So typically when I notice a Ellis class three, if the patient doesn't have a whole lot else going on, I will usually dry that part of the tooth. I'll let it dry for a few seconds and I'll put some derma bond on top of that Ellis class three. And then I'll let it dry for a full 60 seconds. Once they close their mouth, then it will be protected from air and hot and cold at least for a few days until they can get in to see a dentist. This is just a temporizing measure, very important to realize. Um, and it's not something that should be used for a Ellis class two or one. And it definitely should not be used for an alveolar fracture. So the alveolar fracture as given in this picture is a fracture of the actual socket of the tooth. An alveolar fracture is either a mandibular or maxillary fracture, and that is an, considered a skull fracture. So an alveolar fracture is a lot bigger of a deal than something just like a, an Ellis classification. That said, not all dental fractures are, or I should say dental traumas are all about fractures. Notice that we have in the middle area, in this area, that this tooth is completely missing and it's the entire tooth, including the root, it looks like. That's called an avulsion. Avulsions are very common in trauma in childhood, like ice skating and then falling over and their tooth falls out and their mom brings their tooth in milk or Hank's solution. It's always important never to put it in water, but it's also important to know that if it's a baby tooth, do not replace that tooth. Only replace the tooth if it is an adult tooth and only if it's been within a few hours. I repeat, only if it's been a few hours. If it's been out typically longer than two to six hours, and yes, that's a very wide range, we do not replace them. And replacing them usually hurts considerably and can cause significant damage. So if the tooth is completely out of socket and it's been out of socket longer than two hours, I do not replace that tooth. I also want you to know that most uh, dentists recommend that you treat with doxycycline or penicillin VK for a tooth avulsion. They usually call teeth avulsions and alveolar fractures a open fracture. So please consider that when you're treating somebody with an avulsion. Now, another example of a dental problem is a luxation. Now I know you're looking at me like, what the heck is a luxation? Well, a luxation or a subluxation is where a area of teeth are particularly loose. So even though you can't necessarily tell it from the picture, that tooth with the ring around it of blood um, got hit pretty hard. And in comparison to the other teeth around it, it's very easy to wiggle. Now you don't wanna pull that tooth out, obviously. It's not completely avulsed and it's not fractured, it's just loose. That is considered a subluxation. And typically how we handle a luxation or a subluxation is that we have a dentist follow up within 24 hours. So that means that they don't need to come in immediately, right? And um, we will do a dental brace. Yes, a dental brace. That is what this picture below is showing. So you can see that what um, we've done here is I have clipped a paper clip and put it across the teeth. So it touches both teeth on either side. And then you take a derma bond or whatever skin adhesive, you've dried it. And then we have glued the paper clip to every single tooth. So it holds the tooth in place. I have done this several times. It works very, very, very well. I've had several dentists refer us um, refer their patients to us because we know how to do this. This is very easy to do. You Just the big key is making sure you wipe off the teeth before you do it and you use enough Dermabond to hold that paper clip to the teeth. Remember that you don't want any edges, pointy edges of that dental or of the paper clip pointing and ripping their gums or their um, inside of the lip. So you wanna fully cover that and you wanna measure and clip it specifically for them. 
Finally, the last part in this slide is how do we classify this picture here? You can still see that the teeth are still kind of held in place by tissue. They're not quite completely avulsed and they're definitely not subluxated and they're not fractured. We call this a subluxation avulsion. And typically what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna treat it very similar to a luxation in that you're gonna dry off these teeth. You're actually going to push them back up into the socket. And then you're gonna go ahead and do a brace for this tooth. Um, and obviously that's gonna be a longer paper clip. It's gonna be considerably more, um, it's gonna be considerably more time consuming. Notice that unlike with the subluxation where I have included the paper clip in the front, if possible, I would put the paper clip in the back of this tooth um, because that's where they're gonna be loose. They're gonna be falling out towards the back of the teeth. So I would put the paper clip behind the teeth in this particular scenario. All right, now let's talk a little bit about facial droop. So you can see here that this patient has a right-sided facial droop that she probably is not faking because this is almost impossible to fake. There are three big causes of facial drooping that you should be aware of. And yes, I realize that this is not the neuro section. So the first one is stroke. You know, there's some bleed over here. The body is as a whole, so we have to talk a little bit about it. Next is Bell's palsy, and that is a big differentiating factor. However, there's also a third cause, and that is any kind of ear trauma, swelling, or infection. And we're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes. So there are three big causes of facial droop, and so we need to know those differential causes because the treatments are vastly different. And who we're going to call for consult is also going to be vastly different. So I know this looks a little overwhelming, but it's important that you understand the differences. So I want you to go with me anyway. Don't worry, we're going to walk through this. So what you're noticing is that um, this person is the same person with every scenario and they're having facial droop with every scenario. The green and blue nerves are the nerves that are innervating that side of the face. It's the trigeminal nerve. Now notice that we have three different areas of the lesion, right? We have the lesion in C that's up here by the brain. We have the lesion in B that's out here in the periphery, right? It's not in the brain. And then we have the lesion in A, which is actually really peripheral. It's only a very sub-segmental part of the nerve, okay? So that's the very first difference. So you'll notice that A is more like an ear infection or swelling problem. B is more of a Bell's palsy issue. And C is gonna be your stroke, okay? Um, the big differences to notice in real life in person is something that we consider forehead sparing. So forehead sparing means that if they try to raise their eyebrows or wrinkle their eyebrows, are they going to be able to, or are they not going to be able to? So the only one of these that has, um, they cannot raise their eyebrow, as you can see from this picture here, is Bell's palsy. So if they can't raise their eyebrow, it's actually due to some swelling of the nerves, usually by some sort of herpes zoster or virus that's out here in the periphery that's making both nerves swell. So the brain can't compensate and the face can't compensate. So if you have a person who has facial droop and they cannot raise their eyebrow, that is probably the best possible scenario. Now, if they can raise their eyebrow, right? Because what you have to know about stroke is that um, the forehead, notice that it's the blue nerve as we go up here, the blue nerve is dual innervated. So that means even though there's just one nerve, it goes to both sides. 
So when there's a stroke, AKA a blood clot or a bleed on one side, it's actually going to only affect the lower half of the face and the brain is going to compensate for that forehead. That said, we also are going to have the forehead sparing out here if we have an ear problem. And this is because of where the nerves are located. And I want to go into that here in this next slide. So I got to, I got to clean up all of my little marks here. Here is a better picture of how the nerve comes out anatomically. And so what you're going to notice about this nerve is that it's very close to the ear. So we're looking at this picture with the ear anatomy. Okay. Here is our facial nerve. And here is how close it is to the inner ear. So if that inner ear gets swollen, let's say you just have a simple ear infection. If it gets swollen enough, that is going to push on that nerve and that can cause some facial droop. What about if you have a mastoid problem or if you have any kind of issue where you've punctured your tympanic membrane and now this whole thing is swollen? Any kind of problem that is going to cause that inner ear to swell because of how close that facial nerve runs. Look at how close that runs. It's very, very close. That can cause facial droop. So don't jump immediately to stroke, or at least if you do, at least take a brief look inside that person's ear, because that could be just simple swelling of the ear that could be causing that facial droop. I also want you to notice in this other picture how um, that nerve goes through the parotid gland. So if you have a problem with your parotid gland, you're also going to have a problem with facial droop. All right, here is an example of a problem with that nerve. This is Ramsey Hunt syndrome. This is essentially herpes zoster of the ear. So you're going to get the little pustule lesions of shingles out on the ear. But because the infection is infecting that nerve and causing swelling, you're also getting lower facial palsy. Ramsey Hunt syndrome is important to note, not just for the way that I described to you how the nerve runs in the swelling area, but it's also really important to know because Ramsey Hunt syndrome is a little bit rare and it's very famous for its severe complications. Notice that these complications are more severe than other herpes zoster. So it's not just that it hurts, it's that you could get herpes meningitis. It's that you could get encephalitis or Guillain-Barre. You could have all kinds of long-term issues because of the herpes zoster and which nerve it has infected. So Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is really important to notice. We treat Ramsey-Hunt syndrome very aggressively with steroids and also gancyclovir or acyclovir in the same way that we treat herpes zoster of the eye. And we also want to go ahead and make sure they are following up with an ENT specialist because again, we want to monitor for things like herpes encephalitis, even in a, in a non-immunocompromised patient. So this should be something that you guys recommend, recognize and are aware of. Next up, we have to talk about four major causes of facial swelling. So you can see the pictures at the top of the two boys who are showing some facial swelling on the left side, and you can see it visibly in both pictures. Both of them could be any of these four causes of facial swelling. And there's really only one that is an incredible emergency, okay? Almost all the rest of them are going to get treated and they're going to go home. So we have peritidis, we have sci sialoadenitis or sialolithiasis, we have a dental abscess, and we have Ludwig's angina. So peritidis is um, actually starting to be more and more uncommon, although you will see it in your career at least once. 
Most of the time it's swelling of the parotid gland caused by a virus. The most common and the most famous virus was the mumps virus. Now I know that we're all likely vaccinated in childhood, but remember that there are quite a few anti-vaxxers out there or people from other countries. So we do still see mumps sometimes. Notice that one of the special things about the parotid gland is that it's not only just of the cheek area, but it goes right below, that tail goes right below the mandible. And that is where you're gonna see the swelling. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we're definitely gonna talk about superative parotitis a little bit later in this lecture. Superative parotitis is purulent or pus coming out of the par parotid gland. And again, we're gonna talk about that a little later. The parotid gland, in case you didn't know, just makes a bunch of spit for you. Same goes for the spit glands under the mandible. And that's where sialoadenitis or sialolithiasis comes into play. If those spit glands get infected by the same virus and it's just not the parotid gland, you can get considerable swelling. You can also make a salivary stone. Not sure if you've had a whole lot of training or education on salivary stones. They're a little bit more common than people give them credit for. And what you're seeing in this picture over here is a salivary stone underneath the tongue in a, uh, in a salivary gland submandibularly. This can cause quite a lot of pain. And it's really important that you recommend to these patients that we increase the salivation. And the way we do that is by recommending that they go to the store and they buy hard lemon candies that they suck on. That citrus causes you to release more sal saliva and will help work that um, stone out. So salivary stones are more common with dehydrated folks or people who are fasting. So it's really important that you tell them that they make sure to drink more water as well. Okay, so we've gone through the top two. Now look at the bottom, look at that dental abscess. Notice that it almost looks like it involves the eye. A lot of times these patients are gonna come in because they've waited too long on their dental pain that it's now become an abscess and it's in the tip of the tooth. So you're not gonna be able to see it when you look in the mouth, but you will be able to see that a lot of times the pain radiates backwards towards the ear. Remember how I showed you the anatomy of that nerve and how it radiates back towards the ear? And they're gonna have a particularly tender tooth that hurts more than any other. How we deal with this, no matter how bad that looks, is we're gonna give them some sort of antibiotic like PenVK or doxycycline. It's highly not recommended to use Clinda because there's been a lot of overuse of Clinda recently. So try to use PenVK or if they're allergic, use doxy. Ibuprofen or Tordol is gonna to be the best way to help their pain other than doing a dental block. So I recommend that you do not give these folks opiates. And as always, make sure they see a dentist within the next 24 hours, although most dentists won't see them until they've had 24 hours of antibiotics. And then last but not least is, as you guessed it, <clears throat> Ludwig's angina. Ludwig's angina is the emergency of all of the facial swellings. The special thing that I want you to notice about it is it's usually, not always, but usually bilateral. Notice that the swelling is definitely all submandibular and there's definitely a cellulitis with it. You can see a redness. If you were to have him open up his mouth, then you will see that underneath the tongue, there's a raised area bilaterally. So it doesn't look like the picture with the stone, it's bilateral raising of the underneath the tongue. We're going to talk about Ludwig's angina a little bit later in this lecture. So again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it here. I just wanted to make you aware of all of the different possibilities here. Now we're finally going to get into our ENT part of this lecture. So let's go over a couple of things on ear emergencies. So I'm going to do a quick rapid trauma review just to keep it in your mind. And then of course, we're gonna go over ear swelling and pain. And there's only four different differentials I'm giving you there. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about some hearing loss 
and just a couple of scenarios there. This is not for the faint of heart. I'm just letting you know. So here are findings of the trauma must know for ENT. So do you know what to call it if you look inside somebody's ear and you see a bunch of blood behind the ear? What about this sign where you look behind the ear and on the mastoid, you see a big bruise? What about this particular sign where you either see blood or sometimes just clear fluid leaking out the ear or sometimes even the nose? And if you drop it on a piece of paper, it makes this, it's called a halo sign. I hope that you're familiar with all of these because these are really important findings to know. This one is called hemotympanum. This one is called battle sign. And this one is a CSF leak, right? So all of these are big signs that the person has a basal or skull fracture. Basal or skull fractures are a really big deal because they can lead to meningitis, they can cause bleeding, and they're very unstable, but they're often missed in CT heads. So when you have a big trauma panel workup, there may not be an obvious sign of skull fracture. It may say negative. And unless you document your findings, you might miss a basal or skull fracture. So you can see it pictured here. This is the long uh, fracture in this bone right here. Because remember, this is the ear right here. And this is a CT temporal bone. CT temporal bone is a specific kind of CT made looking for basal or skull fractures, and it still misses at least 10 to 15% of them. So it's important that you recognize that this be a clinical diagnosis and make sure you, you know if you're suspicious of a basal or skull fracture, don't let anybody tell you differently. All right, let's talk a little bit about some ear swelling and pain. So the first big thing is a ear hematoma. I realize that the main picture here is not a human, but after looking at pictures on Google for such a long time, I wanted to include a whole bunch of veterinary pictures because apparently that's vets deal with this all the time. So an ear hematoma Remember that the ear is made of cartilage and that we have a whole bunch of pressure from this blood clot in the ear. This happens in boxers quite a bit and I guess in animals who fight. If you leave it alone and you don't do anything with the ear hematoma, the cartilage can necrose and die and that's when we get something called cauliflower ear. While cauliflower ear is cosmetically gross and doesn't look right, the big deal about cauliflower ear is that because anatomically your ear is no longer um, acoustically shaped, you have a significant decrease of hear lo hearing loss. And this is not something that we have figured out how to do plastic surgery to fix. So this is a permanent hearing loss because your cartilage died. Therefore, what you need to do with these ear hematomas is you need to know what they are and you need to know that these need to be drained. And yes, I do mean that you need to needle aspirate these um, ear hematomas and you have to be aware because not all of them are full of liquid blood. Blood clots, especially if it's been there for a couple of hours. So you might have to make a little bit of a hole and kind of push the blood clot out. Once the blood clot has been taken out or the blood, that's not enough. We're not done yet. You also have to wrap the ear and that's what's shown down here below. This ear wrap is so that ear hematoma doesn't reaccumulate. So notice that you need to put padding behind the ear so that way you're not shoving it against the head. And then you put padding on top of the ear to kind of pancake it in between the um, dressing, and then you need to wrap some gauze around the head. Now you can see that this, if you don't do it properly, is going to fall off. 
So it's really important to have them keep this ear dressing on for at least the first 12 to 48 hours. That is because we want that bleeding to stop. So if they're on anticoagulation, they need to lean more towards the 48 hour mark. If they're a normal person, just leaving it on for at least eight hours. So that way the ear can hear heal and the hematoma won't reaccumulate for ear loss would be really ideal. Here is a picture of some needle aspiration of a real ear hematoma. I'm not exactly sure why this guy is not wearing gloves, but I guess he's doing it in a car or something. Now let's talk a little bit about ear abscesses. Notice that ear abscesses can be anywhere. They can be in the pinna of the ear, but they can also be right behind the ear. We have recently seen a really increased spike in ear abscesses. We thought at first it was due to piercings, but as it turns out, because of COVID and everyone else hanging out, it's actually because of all of this earbud stuff. People wearing earbuds more and more, and they don't clean off their earbuds, and they're wearing them for very long periods of time, maybe because they have to listen to lectures online, they end up getting ear abscesses. So in the same way that an ear hematoma can cause a lot of pressure on the cartilage of the ear, same can be with the abscess. So it's really important that you make sure that you drain these completely, not that you wouldn't do that, but then you also need to wrap ear abscesses in the same way that you wrap ear hematomas. So the only difference in the care here is that, is what fluid comes out. Is it a blood clot? Is it blood or is it pus? Remember that these abscesses, as long as you talk to them about maybe treating um, these appropriately, they don't need antibiotics. Here are a ginormous map of all the different kinds of ear infections. So otitis externa is swimmer's ear, right? And you can have eczema, eczematous otitis externa, you can have chronic otitis externa, or you could have acute. Notice that you can also have fungal or necrotizing. So all of these have to do with the chronicity and also the organism that's involved. So definitely keep your ear on the ground and think a whole lot about how long these people have had this issue because ENT manages these very well, very frequently. Know that there are lots of different kinds and lots of different types. Even though most of the time we think about acute, there are others. The one that I wanna talk about the most is necrotizing otitis externa. And as you can tell from the name, necrotizing is always bad, right? Like necrotizing fasciitis. So necrotizing otitis externa is usually caused by pseudomonas. And usually these people need a lot of, a lot of help with this because most otitis externas are gonna be treated with ear drops. And when they're treated with ear drops, that's not going to be enough to cover pseudomonas. Because of that, they end up needing oral antibiotics and they need four weeks of it. So the typical ot otitis externa medications are not going to help with this. We treat these very aggressively. These are going to be most common in elderly patients with diabetes. And if they don't get the appropriate care, they are one of the highest percentages, a 46% mortality rate, because this infection goes straight to the brain and causes a brain abscess. If you see something like necrotizing otitis externa, think of it more as an infection of the skull, the bone, of the ear canal itself. It's not just of the tissue that's overlying the bone, it's of the bone too. And always do a CT of these patients or at least admit them because we wanna prevent that brain abscess from forming. So here's another option, uh, mastoiditis. 
I'm sure that most of you guys have already heard of this one. Mastoiditis is the most common complication of otitis media, especially in children. So you can see a picture of that right here. This kid had an otitis media infection that wasn't properly treated. And you can see that it went into the bone itself right here. You can see that all of these mastoid processes look a little bit different, but they're always painful and they're always infected. Um, notice that in the picture on the top in B, the tympanic membrane is, look, does not look infected any longer. So you can have somebody who no longer has otitis externa, but now has mastoiditis. Know that these are now two separate entities. We also care a whole lot about mastoiditis because as you can imagine, it's very easy for that infection in the bone behind the ear to go straight into the brain and cause a meningitis or an abscess or hearing loss, especially if we're talking about a kid. This does need two weeks of antibiotics. However, you don't always have to admit the mastoiditis kids. You just have to make sure that they get a full two weeks of oral antibiotics not eardrops, right? So here's a comparison of necrotizing otitis externa with mastoiditis. And what you're looking at here is that the mastoiditis is of that mastoid process back here being eaten away. And it's also filled with fluid. Notice that there's air, which is black in this normal mastoid process. And this one is filled with fluid. We can see that on the other picture of necrotizing otitis externa. See how it's full of air on this side and it's normal. And you can see this is the normal ear canal. Whereas on this side, we can't see the ear canal at all because it's so swollen. And while we don't see it being eaten away like we do on the mastoid process, we see it full of a bunch of fluid. I hope that makes a lot of sense for you guys. Remember that some of these are um, really in-depth uh, temporal bone or mastoiditis uh, CT scans. Now let's talk a little bit about hearing loss. The first thing that we learn about is Meniere's because you need to be able to recognize it. Why? Because they need an ENT consult. Is this something that we're going to be able to treat in the emergency department? No. As a matter of fact, Meniere's disease is, as far as we know, incurable. Think of it like a glaucoma of the ear or almost like pseudotumor. So this is an area of the body where they're making, your ear, inner ear is making too much endolymph or the fluid that is in the middle ear. And because of that, we're going to experience dizziness and vertigo we're gonna experience tinnitus, which is that loud ringing of the ear and hearing loss. And it's all because your inner ear is making too much fluid. Again, this is progressive and we're not really able to fix this, but definitely needs a ENT consult. Now we're talking about a tympanic membrane rupture. The most common cause of a membrane rupture is trauma especially because people are using a lot of Q-tips or other objects to clean out their ears. This happens a lot if moms try to clean out their kids' ears as well. So definitely discourage that. However, tympanic membrane ruptures can happen from um, otitis medias as the eardrum bursts and they suddenly get tons of relief. Interestingly, if a tympanic membrane is caused by an otitis media, they don't get a whole lot of terrible symptoms. It heals relatively quickly and you sometimes don't even know about it. Whereas if a tympanic membrane ruptures from trauma or a foreign body, there is a, a bunch of really dramatic symptoms. Things like vertigo, like exorcist vomiting. It's truly, truly terrible. Lots of drainage, sometimes bleeding. So please know that if it's done for a trauma, have a little bit more compassion. I personally ruptured my tympanic membrane 
also doing this thing I'm telling you not to do, which is cleaning my ears out with a Q-tip. And it was a really terrible experience. I was really dizzy and sick for four days and I couldn't stand. I actually had to call into work. And the only thing that helped me was not meclizine. Meclizine did not help the dizziness with the tepanic membrane rupture. The only thing that worked was IV Valium. So I wanna point this out to you because this was not something that I was aware of at the time. And while it was really handy for my ENT to tell me that it heals by itself in about two weeks to eight weeks, right? That wasn't really something that I wanted to deal with if I have to be off of work for that long. So it was great because in about four days, I was able to do my job, but definitely worthwhile to know that the younger you are, the better able you are to handle a tepanic membrane rupture. And the older you are, the less able you are and the more dramatic your symptoms. It is also impossible um, to uh, kind of calm parents down when you tell them that their kid has a tepanic membrane rupture and they'll often ask a lot of questions. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that you have to keep this dry. So you have to tell them that they can't have any swimming. And a lot of parents will put a cotton ball in the ear canal to just protect it. Um, do not put any drops in that ear. You want to keep it dry. And I did put a, a normal TM in case you haven't seen it right here in this box up here. All right, now let's talk about some foreign bodies in the ear. Okay, unlike this obvious picture that's down here where they remove an entire bug who's completely alive, it looks like a bee or a wasp, that happens so rarely, okay? Most of the time, somebody with a foreign body in the ear, especially if it's a bug or if it's alive, they're gonna know about it. They get out very dizzy and it's very painful to have something scratching at your tympanic membrane. Be very careful with these. The, the best first step, in my opinion, besides taking out a live bug, which is crazy to me, is to drown it. So usually I put a whole bunch of mineral oil or even lidocaine to try to be nice to them and just drown the bug in the fluid first. As long as it's not scratching at the eardrum, we have stopped all further damage from happening. After that, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about taking out a foreign body of the ear. So if it's a bug, my first recommendation is you drown it. If it's something like a bead, there are lots of other different ways to handle this, but you can use something like an alligator forceps as is pictured here. You can also use a bunch of ear curettes. A lot of hospitals will have these. You can also use warm water flushes. So as you're flushing the ear with warm water, um, it only has so, so much places to go as long as that tympanic membrane isn't ruptured. So eventually that bug or that um, object is gonna float out of the ear. Now, it's important to use warm water or if it's mineral oil, you can use room air. Just don't use cold water, especially if your tap tends to be cold because that can cause them to throw up. So be nice, use warm water. Now, what would happen if a person comes in, they have a bug in the ear, you've, moved, you've used all the tools, you've irrigated and you've drowned the bug and you can only get it out in pieces, which is, always how it ends up for me. I can only ever get the bug out in pieces. But now you're having a really hard time. You've actually scraped up their ear canal, it's bleeding, and you can't get it out. What do you do? Do you keep them there for hours and hours and keep trying to dig it out? The answer is no. You can send these people home to follow up with ENT and that is perfectly acceptable as long as the bug is no longer alive and causing further damage. Same goes for particularly hard beads or other objects. If you can't get it out of the ear, do not cause more damage by trying to get it out with multiple tools. If you've done your due diligence and you've tried enough times, or if the kid is just not taking it, it's okay to send them to ENT clinic the very next day. 
I also have a really fun fact for you. The reason why certain bugs get stuck in ears like wasps or beetles is because those bugs actually cannot reverse. Weird fun fact. They can only go forward. So no matter what, that bug is getting stuck in your ear if it's too big because it can't turn around. Now, let's talk about the nose. And as you can see, there's really only a couple of things that you need to know about the nose. So let's talk about the nose function for just a second. Not a lot of people give the nose love. It is a part of the airway. And the reason that we have a nose and we don't all just breathe out of our mouth is that nose's job is to humidify the air to warm it. If you've ever been anywhere cold and you walk outside and you feel that cold air just fill your lungs, it's not as cold as it is outside. And that's because your nose kind of uh, spins the air around. That's why we have turbinates. So that way the airflow is not straight. It's very um, tumultuous and it stirs the air as it before it goes into the lungs and it warms that air. It also uses mucus, AKA our boogers, to catch bacteria and toxins and allergens. So that way that we're not putting toxic or bacteria or bugs into our lungs where we wouldn't be able to survive or handle it. So our nose does quite a lot of things for us. And as such, it gets some pretty good blood supply. This is the carotid. And you can see that we have two branches of the carotid that are going into the nose. The first branch is this one here, our facial artery. And then the second branch is this maxillary artery here. It's really important to notice these branches, not because I'm gonna test you on it, but because I want you to understand how close it is to the carotid. This is why when we talk about nosebleeds, you have to understand that you can die from a nosebleed because it's essentially like cutting your throat. So there's two areas in the nose. One is called the Kesselbach's plexus, it's right here. And the other one is the Woodruff's plexus. So Kesselbach's plexus is an anterior nosebleed and Woodruff's plexus is a posterior nosebleed. Posterior nosebleeds or the one off the maxillary artery are always bigger blood vessels. So that means they have a lot more pressure behind them, which means that you have a lot higher chance of bleeding to death. Anterior nosebleeds are a lot less scary. So let's talk about the less scary one because they're also more common. There's a lot of different causes of anterior epistaxis. And a lot of that is due to nose picking or anterior trauma. Some of it is also due to nose fractures, like we talked about a little bit earlier in this lecture. But other things that dry out your nose that cause it easy bleeding are things like anticoagulants or cigarette smoke or too many nasal sprays like steroids. And same can happen with um, problems with your platelet dysfunction. It's also important to know that you should look inside the nose using the otoscope because you might be surprised what you find. This is a normal inside the nose picture where you can see the septum is over here. So we're looking at, so there's a nostril here and a nostril here. And you can see that there's a turbinate here and a turbinate here and a turbinate here. And those turbinates are just supposed to be mixing the air like we talked about earlier. You can see that they're nice and pink and not red and swollen. Here is one. <clears throat> that are terribly swollen. And look at that. There is an object in the nose. Foreign bodies are often the cause of nosebleeds, especially recurrent ones. And you'd be surprised how often this gets missed. The kid or even sometimes the adult doesn't know or won't tell you that there's something in there. So 
let's go through how to stop a anterior nosebleed. So besides looking at the area and seeing if we can see the bleed or if there's a cause like a foreign object, we need to hold pressure for a full two minutes. Now, it's important that you not lean back because if there's extra bleeding, we don't want it going down into your stomach and then causing you to throw up later. We want you to lean forward so we know if it's continuing to bleed and you wanna pinch right below that bony ridge, right above that um, area where you would pierce your nose. So you hold that area for two minutes. It's also important for you to know that it hurts. If you get your nose held for two minutes in that area, it is uncomfortable for the patient. That means that you're holding the nose appropriately. One of the next best steps is using Afrin. Oh yeah. And um, this is a tongue depressor blade that somebody used with rubber band to hold pressure on the anterior part of the nose because some provider decided that they were too lazy to sit in there and hold pressure on the nose. This is also a contraption that patients can take home, especially the elderly ones with recurrent anterior bleeds, not posterior. Oops. I'm so sorry. So we want to do hold pressure. If that doesn't work, then we use Afrin. If you can tell where the nosebleed is bleeding from, you can use a silver nitrite cautery. I know that sometimes it's taught that you can just use the silver nitrite and just like wiggle it around in the nose and hope it works, but that is really not recommended. So if you can't tell where the bleed is coming from, please don't use silver nitrite. And don't use silver nitrite on the septum because you can burn a hole through it. If after doing those things, you still don't have control, then we use a nasal tampon or a rhino rocket. And then if you still don't get anywhere, that's when we do an ENT consult. If you are able to get it to stop, I highly recommend you tell your patient about these nasal precautions in this lower corner, which means no nose blowing, no sucking out of straws, try not to sneeze, try not to lift heavy objects or be pushing or bending. Basically what we wanna do is we don't want to break that scab. So anything that's gonna cause an increase in the blood pressure to that area, which are a list of all of those things, are things that we want to avoid. All right, now what happens if we get posterior epistaxis? So remember that we're still gonna start the same way that we start with anterior, which is look inside the nose. You can see from this top picture that sometimes when you look inside the nose, that's what I see. It's just a bloody mess and I don't see anything at all. If you are able to see that the nose bleed stopped, which is awesome, sometimes you can see the blood clot in the back of the nose. Do not, I repeat, do not take that blood clot off. It is trying to stop the blood, right? Now, posterior bleeds are considerably more serious than um, anterior bleeds. And so I have a bunch of extra tricks that can help you stop a posterior nosebleed. So remember that we still wanna hold pressure, but if it's posterior, holding pressure isn't gonna help. Spraying a crap ton of Afrin around up there can sometimes help, but very rarely helps posterior bleeds. What might actually help is if you get some transoxemic acid. Transoxemic acid um, given either IV or you can soak the nasal packing in transoxemic acid and Afrin. Both of those are gonna either help you to stop the bleeding and encourage clotting. Um, Afrin works by vasoconstricting. So hopefully with less blood in that area, we'll have less swelling and less bleeding. Don't forget to look in the back of the throat when you have somebody with a nosebleed to see if the bleeding is going down the back of the throat. Just because it's not coming down the front of the face doesn't mean it's not still bleeding. Also want you to consider looking at the blood pressure and the INR. If the patient has a really high INR, you're gonna have a really hard time stopping the bleed. 
And same goes with the high blood pressure. So it might be worthwhile to give them just a little bit of labetalol or whatever your blood pressure medication of choice is to get that blood pressure down. So that way we can stop the bleeding. So let's talk a little bit about nasal packing. So I don't know if you've ever had the enjoyment of nasal packing, but there's lots of different kinds, types, and brands. The most common is gonna be what you're seeing up here. And I want you to know that they do come in sizes. And this is because there's a difference in your nose. You can have an anterior bleed, which needs the top size, or you could have a really terrible posterior bleed. It's kind of silly to use a posterior nosebleed um, packing, nasal packing for an anterior problem. So what you have to do is you have to soak your nasal packing. Do not put it in dry. That's just mean and also ineffective. Even though this picture is showing that you need to soak your nasal packing in water, I recommend that you soak it in Afrin and transoxemic acid. That way you're getting those two medicines to the area of the problem. Next is you need to insert the nasal packing straight back. So you don't want the patient to be looking up straight back. Okay, you don't want to angle it towards the brain. You want to angle it along the floor of the nose. So you push it straight back into the back posterior area, and then you use a syringe to blow it up. Now, a lot of people, and these are what they look like blown up, will use saline, highly recommended against. If for some reason this causes a, um, this breaks inside the person's nose, they're gonna feel like they're drowning and they're gonna cough up things and they might start bleeding again. So please don't fill these with saline. Please use air instead. This is the old school way of nasal packing. Uh, kind of crazy to me and very interesting discussion points. Um, but I guess if you're somewhere in the third world country, that's uh, always an option. Uh, for now, in uh, the Americas, we do make these nasal packings where they have an anterior balloon and a posterior balloon, kind of like the king tube. Those uh, tubes are really handy because if you don't know where the bleeding is coming from, it's going to get both sides. Now, remember, we have lots of steps before we can stop that. Now we're going to talk about the side effects of bad nasal packing. Besides kind of not having it be effective, which is probably one of the biggest side effects, if you leave nasal packing in place. So once you pack the nose, typically what I do is I leave it in place for 30 minutes and then I take down the nasal packing. If after I take it down, and of course clots are gonna come out, so give it just a few minutes. If it starts bleeding again, like it was before, then you need to put the nasal packing back in and you can send them home with nasal packing in place. However, if you take it out and it stops bleeding, then you're good to go and you don't need any more nasal packing. <clears throat> If you send them home with nasal packing in place, it's really important that you tell them that they needs to be taken out in about three days or less. So usually I recommend that in 24 hours, they get seen by their ENT. And if they can't get in with their ENT, they come back to the ER where I have one of my colleagues take out the nasal packing. We want to do this because if we don't, we can have cartilage necrosis. Remember talking about the ear and how pressure on cartilage is going to cause necrosis? Well, your septum is made of cartilage. So is most of your nose. So if we have too much pressure on it for too long, and all it takes is two or three days, you, we can have death of the septum or death of areas of the nose because of that pressure of nasal packing. And I guarantee you that that patient won't be happy and they will probably try to start a lawsuit. So it's really important for you to know that the nasal packing needs to come out in about 24 hours 
And if they can't get into the ENT doctor, they need to come back to the ER. The other big scary thing about nasal packing is that a lot of nasal packing is made with cotton. It's very similar to tampons. And you might remember, but lots of leaving in tampons is the toxic shock syndrome. You might remember that from the skin uh, module. But because of that, a lot of doctors like to give Keflux prophylactically if the nasal packing stays in longer than 24 hours. This is why I recommend it comes out within 24 hours so you don't have to mess with antibiotics. All right, now we can finally talk about a nasal fracture. Well, this is basically the same slide as earlier. An independent, alone nasal fracture, we're not going to do anything about. Usually we have them follow up, even if it's out of place. And what the plastic surgery folks do is they re-break it literally months later and then they fix it. The main difference, there's a lot of different kinds of ways that this can be broken. Remember that a nasal fracture has to be the bone of the nose. You can break and dislodge the cartilage of the nose and that's what this picture here is showing you. So this is the bone aspect of the nose, and this is the cartilage aspect of the nose. If the cartilage aspect of the nose, which is usually the cosmetic part, is out of whack, there is something that you can do to help, and that is stick a pen in their nose. This is what I mean. If you stick a pen in their nose, it'll straighten it out and you can push it the opposite way and it'll straighten the cartilage. Now remember, we're not trying to push the, the pen up the nose high enough that it gets back into the bony aspect of the nose, okay? We don't wanna push the bones of the broken nose into the brain. And we're not trying to pack their nose, right? Do not pack somebody who has a broken nose. But we can kind of go straight up with a pen and kind of pop that nose right back into place. Now, what happens if there's a TV personality who has a terrible nasal fracture and you can't get it back into place and it looks really bad and they're demanding to see a plastic surgeon tonight? Some people might say, well, I'm gonna go back there and call the ENT doctor, but I'm gonna tell you right now, they're still not gonna come in. Plastic surgery still won't come in. I don't care who these people are, they're not gonna come in. This is not an emergency, it's not life-threatening, and a lot of the plastic surgeons prefer to do this two or more weeks after the fracture because when they can control the break, they can refigure out how to put the nose back together. So now let's get through our throat and mouth emergencies. And we have swelling, odynophagia, which means painful swallowing, and we have some bleeding. And then I have three quick cases to walk through and then we're done. So let's go through some swelling. We've kind of already talked about this in the skin module. However, anaphylaxis is a really big deal. Anaphylaxis is kind of a throat problem because a lot of times people think of anaphylaxis when we have tongue or lip swelling. And it is important to know that just tongue or lip swelling isn't enough. Anaphylaxis by definition involves at least three organ systems. So you could have hypotension, you could have tongue swelling, you could have airway wheezing, you could be vomiting from the GI tract, you could have urticaria. There's a lot of things that goes into anaphylaxis. Remember that we use epi IM 0.3 milligrams and we don't wait if it's anaphylaxis. And we don't spend any time trying to ID why this person had anaphylaxis. You treat it first and questions later. We also always refer to an allergist. I'm sure you remember this from the skin lecture, so I'm not gonna go into crazy details. Oh yeah, remember that we have rebound anaphylaxis, also called biphasic anaphylaxis, which does occur in about five to 20% of anaphylactic patients, which is why we send them home with steroids. Really, that's it. 
Now we're going to talk about angioedema. Notice that we have airway swelling, like lip swelling or tongue swelling, but there's no other involvement of any of the other organ systems. So we don't have nausea, we don't have vomiting, we don't have urticaria, we don't have hypotension, none of the typical anaphylactic symptoms. Angioedema is not well understood, although we do think that it might be related genetically to things like lisinopril or C1 esterase deficiency. I'm sure this has gone into your brain at some point, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that. I just recommend that you give steroids and Benadryl and Pepsid and Epi early. Although I will tell you, Epi will not change or fix this. This is why we tell people to intubate early. Ludwig's angina, if you remember from earlier, we talked about that earlier this lecture for facial swelling. Remember that it is cellulitis of the submandibular spaces. You can see inside this little boy's mouth how there isn't really a floor to the mouth of him anymore because it's so swollen underneath his tongue. And you can see from this uh, graphic picture here that the swelling is underneath the tongue and also in the submandibular area. So it's not the tongue itself that's the problem here, it's below the tongue. So this guy's tongue, not swollen. It's actually the area below the tongue that is swollen. That's why it's such a hard thing to do to get past the tongue to then intubate. So these people end up cracked very frequently. However, if we can control it, like in this lady perhaps, we always see a little bit of cellulitis and redness. See below the chin here? Sometimes we get a little bit of drooling and a lot of people think they're seeing epiglottitis. Definitely should know that Ludwig's angina almost always starts with a dental infection first. That's the most common cause. So it's very similar to a dental infection, but it's infecting the lower submandibular spaces. It's a very fast progression. And a lot of people ask you to intubate early and admit to the ICU. These people also need some IV antibiotics. So please go ahead and start that and always, always admit them. Now let's talk about peritonsillar abscesses. Even though all of y'all know exactly what this is, you'd be surprised by how many people come in with a sore throat and they just get treated for strep without anybody looking in their throat and peritonsillar abscesses get missed all the time. I think that this is very unfortunate because it's a really obvious answer inside. I mean, you're gonna look for things like uvula deviation to point to the side that's the problem. And we're gonna have swelling in the entire side. So notice that the other tonsil is not involved. Now, when this happens, usually you get the muffled voice and usually these people are not, they're beyond antibiotics. So antibiotics are not gonna help a patient with peritonsillar abscess. Like any abscess, they need an IND. So you can go ahead and do a CT scan if you want, and you can find an abscess formation in the back of the throat to confirm it. Or you can just poke them because that's really obviously a peritonsillar abscess. That said, what you want to do is you always want to go in an area right above where the tonsil would be. So for example, in this picture, I'm going to aspirate right here. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things that you need to know before you're draining a peritonsil or abscess. The first thing that you should know is that there is a dreaded complication of draining a peritonsil or abscess, and that is you go too far. Now, why do we care? It's because if you drain this abscess and you're putting it in and you go way too far, what's right behind it? Do you know what this structure is right here? That's the carotid. I don't want you to drain the carotid and then bleed out and then have them die. This is a, just a regular old peritonsillar abscess. So the key is to limit yourself. And it's not even sometimes your fault because obviously it hurts to get poked. So what we wanna do is we wanna come up with something to limit the ability of the needle to go in very deep. And that's where I wanna introduce you to this syringe idea, which I cannot claim, one of my attendings taught me this, but they take 
the needle, the 18 gauge needle, and they cut the tip off. And notice that you want full bevel and then at least about a one centimeter beyond the bevel. If you can cut that clip off with about one centimeter, that's about how much size you need. And then you put that cap back on. This way, it can't go in deeper than that. And you protect yourself. All of this being said, um, I highly recommend that you use acetocaine spray, or you can even use nebulized lidocaine, but you should do something to help with the pain. You should also tell them that you don't do more than two or three sticks. And that's because sometimes all it takes is to poke in the right spot and you may not get a whole lot of pus out, but at least it has now a track to drain from. So in the picture shown below, notice that you're only getting out about one cc of pus in this, even though there's a huge amount of pus back here. This is pretty typical. Most peritonsal abscesses, you are not gonna have a very satisfying IND. You're gonna get maybe a little tiny stick of pus. And if you get any at all, feel very lucky. Usually this is, less than one cc of pus back here, but as long as you have that tract for that area to drain, this will heal. Um, in this picture right here, notice that there's a loculation there. So if you put uh, your needle in one, you're probably not gonna get the second, but at least it'll have the ability to drain out. Always have these people follow up with ENT if they're not getting better after 24 hours. And I do not send my peritonsal abscesses home with antibiotics because really drainage is what they need. Now there's another abscess in the back of the throat called the retropharyngeal abscess. So this isn't just behind the tonsils. This is actually behind the esophagus and the tissue itself. So you're not gonna be able to hit this with a needle. This is not something that we do in the emergency department. Most of these retropharyngeal abscesses are after heart surgery, tonsil surgery, or some other kind of post-op complication. That's the most common problem of retropharyngeal abscess. Although I have seen some spontaneous cases. This can kind of prevent, present very similar to meningitis. And I wanna give you a quick story here. One of my nurses came to me because her six-year-old was having a high fever and crying that his neck hurt. And we were all trying to figure out, well, do we tap him for meningitis? I mean, what's going on? She said she really noticed a big difference because when she tried to pick him up, because you know she picks up her six-year-old, when she tried to pick him up, he cried because it moved his neck back. And I was like, I don't know, man, maybe he has a retropharyngeal abscess. Why don't you just go into the ER and scan him? And so of course she went into the ER and told one of my colleagues that I said that he had a retropharyngeal abscess and he needed a scan. So they didn't even do any looking, they just ordered the scan. And when he had a retropharyngeal abscess, Everybody thought I was very brilliant, even though I was just making an offhanded comment. <laughs> so all of this being said, retropharyngeal abscesses are really scary. They're really concerning. They require surgery to fix. And another really interesting uh, fun fact here is if these aren't caught soon enough, what ends up happening is that as the pus and the abscess build up, they go into the chest and they can actually hit right behind the heart. So you can imagine that pus around the heart, never a good thing. Plus you can see from this picture here, how much it blocks off the airway. These both are really, really scary things. So retropharyngeal abscesses are always an emergency and they always need to be consults. Now, finally, we get to talking about supportive peritonitis. I told you this was coming, but supportive peritonitis is just peritonitis that has pus inside instead of just inflammatory fluid. This is <clears throat> not something I see very commonly. I think I've only seen one. And you can see from the CT scan that it has quite a lot of fluid present. 
You can also see from this picture that it goes just below the mandible. And that's my kicker that it's definitely a peritonitis, definitely a viral infection. <clears throat> now, Supportive peritonitis isn't a viral infection, so I misspoke there. I'm sorry about that. It's a bacterial infection, but peritonitis is usually a um, viral infection. So when you look on the inside inner cheek and you push on that area, you're going to elicit pus in the same way that you would from a abscess. Um, so it's essentially a par parotid gland abscess. And that's what supportive peritonitis is. It definitely needs to be drained and it needs IV antibiotics. Um, you can do outpatient ENT follow-up for this as long as they're compliant with their medications. Although if they're immunocompromised or they aren't compliant with their medicines, then you should definitely have them be admitted. Also remember that the facial nerve goes through that parotid gland. So you can have facial palsy with this. And now the big two that are always tested on, even though we don't see epiglottitis very much anymore, and that is croup versus the epiglottitis. So one of them is going to have the drooling, right? So epiglottitis almost always has drooling, and it has thumbprint sign on a neck x-ray. So you can see how big and fat this epiglottis looks. It looks like a thumb. That's the thumbprint sign. So this is now more worrisome in adults. I have only seen one case and it wasn't an adult. This always needs IV antibiotics and admission and usually intubation. Croup, however, we see so commonly. Instead of thumbprint sign, we're seeing steeple sign. And so you can see if you are referring to the black that this looks like a steeple in a church steeple, because what's actually happening here is that the white part, which is um, the tissue, is swelling, closing the airway. And that's causing a barky cough, and it's also causing strider. Croup is very common in children, and we want to give nebulized racemic epi, and often we give albuterol with that or steroids. And we admit these kids, especially if they're less than three months, especially if they have a low SAT. So pay particular attention. Croup still kills infants. It's more common than COVID still. So you need to be aware of this and be very, very careful with it. Now we get to talk about mandibular dislocations. That's right, it's not just for hips and shoulders you can dislocate your mandible. It is rather uncommon, although it does happen with TMJ. It can also happen with trauma, extra wide yawning, and even seizures. So you can see here that what's actually happening, this, it, it should be located in this little joint area. And what's happened is it's come forward. When it comes forward like this, you're going to notice that the person cannot close their mouth. That is very pathognomonic of mandibular dislocations. And to be able to put it back into place, you have to put um, pads on top of the teeth and you have to put your hands on their mouth located like such. And what you're wanting to do is you need it to go down and back in like kind of a circular motion. So it's kind of like this. Um, and what you're trying to do when you're pushing this down, if you look at this image here, is you gotta push it down because we gotta get it underneath this little bump here. So you push it down and back like this. And you gotta do it at the same time with your thumbs and you also have to be very careful because they might accidentally bite your thumb when you put it back into place because then they can suddenly close their mouth again. Okay, now we've got to talk about odynophagia, which also means painful swallowing. And the first big thing that we need to talk about, I know it's just common, is tonsillitis. You're going to see so much of this, you're going to be so much of an expert. If you see an exudate, Typically, most people think strep throat. 
Refer to the center criteria. I know you've heard of this, and if you haven't, it's very easy to Google. We treat strep with amoxicillin. But why do we treat strep with amoxicillin? The answer isn't to fix the strep throat. Did you know that? Bicillin or amoxicillin, it only decreases your pain and um, it doesn't really fix your strep infection. What it does do is it prevents scarlet fever or rheumatic fever, and it prevents you from getting uh, rheumatic heart. If you're not familiar with that, definitely should do some looking up. So we don't, street, we don't treat strep for strep. We treat strep to prevent rheumatic heart disease. Also, if you're strep negative, but somebody still has an obvious exudate like this person up here, you can also think about mono. Mono can cause exudates, but it lasts much longer. And a lot of times you are having really red tonsils like this picture up here. Now, I don't know what you think about this picture here, but I wanted to point out to you that it is not red and there's no exudate. And even with a concern for, for sore throat, this is actually a normal set of tonsils. Yes, they're big, but this can be normal. So I really want you to understand that just because they have a sore throat doesn't always mean strep. And if it's not red, and if it doesn't have an exudate, then you need to look for other places. Now, beyond that, there are a couple other reasons why you could have a sore throat that look very similar to strep. And they look like an exudate, but they're not. For example, thrush. If you just took a very quick peek inside the back of somebody's throat, you saw white spots and or the, maybe the nurse checked it out or maybe your med student checked it out. Thrush is very commonly accidentally associated with exudate. So be sure you take an actual look yourself. And I hope you get to see the difference between a thrush and exudate. Another thing that you can see very commonly is something like this. And I have seen several of these cases and it doesn't really look like an exudate. I mean, it's definitely a little red, but there's something wrong there. It just looks like something wrong. This is cancer. I have seen multiple cases of people who have had sore throats for three years and nothing works and they've been on antibiotics four times and they were hoping that you would have the magic answer and they've had monospots and they've had all the stuff and really what they haven't had is a CT scan because this is cancer. <clears throat> There's another one more thing that I want you guys to be aware of and that is this picture. What you're seeing here <clears throat> are these white ulcer-like areas on the back of the throat that are surrounded by redness. These are very painful. This is the very classic picture of herpangina. Now, other viral illnesses can cause these, these as well. You can have hand, foot, mouth, even in an adult, even if there's not spots on their hands yet. You can have this if there's just one big one, you can have it as a canker sore, or you can even have herpes zoster inside the palate. All of those are viral illnesses. All of them usually go away on their own, but I will let you know that viral tonsillitis usually gets Decadron 10 milligrams IM because it helps so significantly. So always know that there's a bunch of things going on with tonsillitis. Please do your due diligence to look in the back of the throat. And also, if you didn't get a very good look, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to use a tongue depressor and actually push the tongue down and make sure that you're seeing the arches. All right, now we can move on to foreign bodies or food boluses. So the first thing that we wanna talk about is, let's talk about food bolus, I guess. So that's over here. So a food bolus gets stuck into the esophagus. There's usually only a couple of different reasons why this happens. One reason is that the person didn't cut up the meat very well, although we've all swallowed a little bit of a too, too big of a bite and we've been uncomfortable swallowing, but we've been able to do it. 
So usually it could mean something like they've accidentally had a chicken bone stuck in the meat, or maybe their esophagus is having problems actually with the, with the nerve swallowing. That happens to stroke patients, it happens to ALS patients, and it happens to other nerve and muscular disorders. One of the most common causes of food boluses being stuck in elderly is a stricture. You can see this area here where they've swallowed contrast, which is white, and then all of a sudden it narrows, it gets really narrow, and then it goes into the stomach. This is also called achalasia. This happens when you get either an esophageal web and you need stretching, or if you have esophageal cancer. Sometimes this can be the very first sign of esophageal cancer. So when you're encountering somebody who's telling you that they're swallowing a food bolus, the number one thing I recommend is don't always believe them. Consider part of your exam getting them to swallow one swallow of water. If they can actually pass the water and they don't vomit it up immediately, then they're able to swallow. Try some crackers, try some applesauce. If they're able to swallow and they just feel like there's something back there, that's an entirely different workup than an actual food bolus. If you have an actual food bolus that's stuck there, and they swallow a little bit of water, they should be able to complete the swallow. And then after usually about 10 to 20 seconds, they make a very weird noise. And you'll know what I mean when you hear it. And then they retch up whatever it is, almost unchewed or undigested. That is a food bolus. What we're going to do from there, because ENT wants us to have tried something. Remember, I talked about that at the beginning of this lecture. We're going to try glucagon. Glucagon, I am, I haven't seen it work. I hear stories of people saying, yeah, I saw it work once, but it's supposed to relax the esophageal sphincter. I've never seen it work. Some people recommend just a tiny, tiny swallow of Coke and letting it sit there and digest the food. While this sounds like a great idea, it's also digesting your esophagus. So that also kind of sucks. Sublingual nitro actually is a, will relax all of your muscles. It'll give them a headache and it'll drop their blood pressure. But sublingual nitro can and has worked. So that's always another thing to keep in your back pocket if you want to try. Some ENTs even like you to give um, magnesium because it relaxes your muscles. Um, I've never seen magnesium work and it's still kind of a relatively new concept for a lot of ENTs. So I guess we'll have to see what that works. If you've done all of these things, specifically the glucagon, ENTs really want you to try the glucagon. If you do all these things and nothing works, then typically you admit and either ENT or GI will come scope them in the morning. So this is not something that happens like immediately. It's something that happens a little bit later. Now let's talk about foreign bodies. So people swallow foreign bodies all the time and how we manage them depends on where they're stuck and what the object was. So what this picture is pointing to is a chicken bone stuck in the throat. You can see this tiny little white line that the arrow has, that's a chicken bone. That is probably gonna be ENT because it's above the epiglottis. You can see the epiglottis right here. <clears throat> that said, if it's past the epiglottis, it's gonna be GI. At least it is in our hospital. So this is a key, that's gonna be in GI. This is a safety pin that's open, that's gonna be GI. One of the things that you wanna know the difference between is which objects are considered emergencies and which are not. So this key and these random other objects are not that concerning. Most of them will pass within 24 hours. This idea is what our drug packers use and we'll talk about that shortly. Emergencies, however, are gonna be button batteries because the acid in the button battery comes out and actually dissolves your intestine. Button batteries need to be taken out immediately. The other thing that we have to worry about is pointy objects such as this like the safety pin that's open. 
We don't want to perf the bowel, of course. So we really care a whole lot about those patients. And typically we want to go ahead and watch them overnight. Now, I will let you know that there is a big trend, especially for these people who have um, some sort of sharp object like safety pins. There's been a lot of studies found that swallowing needles and sharp objects actually surprisingly don't perf the bowel. Now, maybe this is just luck and chance, or maybe our bodies are cooler than we thought, but we just watch these patients now rather than doing surgery. A lot of psych patients or maybe even prisoners will swallow objects to come to the hospital to either get surgery or to get out of jail for a couple of days. This is particularly common in certain inner cities and I work at one of them, unfortunately. So we're very really unimpressed with people who swallow whatever. Um, really the only big scary one still is the button battery. Oh yeah, this is probably one of the most commonly tested um, foreign bodies that you'll see swallowed. And it's really, really important to know the difference between a coin in the trachea and a coin in the esophagus. Both cause the child distress and hopefully it's a child, right? But one of them is scary and one of them is not. So if you look at the anatomy in this picture here, the esophagus is essentially a meat tube, which means that it can contort around the coin if it needs to. Whereas the trachea has this big C ring that is cartilaginous and it doesn't move very well. So if the coin is in the trachea, the only way it can be is long ways like this. This ligament in the esophagus, it can stretch. So the coin is going to be on the side. So you see that picture in this top x-ray. Um, you can see laterally it's pointing out at you. And then um, anteriorly, it's, um, you can only see the side of it. That means it's in the trachea or the airway. This is a big deal. You need to call ENT, maybe anesthesia. You need somebody with a fiber optic scope that can go down and take this coin out. This is also a kid that you don't want to make angry. You don't want them to cry. And they may be showing signs of respiratory distress. While this coin is in the trachea, it's also important to notice that you can't trach the kid, which means we don't have an airway if we can't get this coin out. Literally, this kid will die because we can't intubate and we can't get, get it out. So this is an emergency. You got to pay a really close attention to this. I hope that you kind of pee your pants a little bit when you see this kind of thing up in the x-ray. The alternative is true for the esophagus because it's the meaty part. The coin usually ends up facing out because the esophagus can conform around it. So you see that a coin in the esophagus, we have the face pointing out at us, whereas in the side, it's the side. This is considerably less scary. And a lot of times the coin can pass on its, set, on its own, but sometimes it won't. If the coin is in place, usually ENT will kind of mosey on in and take it out or GI will. Again, this is going to depend on your location and situation, but these kids do need to be taken care of immediately. Achalasia is something that we talked about earlier. That's uh, one of the reasons why we can have food boluses, but it can cause problems with swallowing. Achalasia is the bird's, it means bird's beak, and you can see that it looks like a bird's beak, I guess, when you swallow contrast. It means that the lower esophageal sphincter is not working. And it can either be a problem with the sphincter, it can be a buildup in the muscle, or it can be cancer. That's the most common cause. Um, if you're doing a barium swallow, don't. Barium is very old school. And especially if there's a perforation in the esophagus, it can cause irritation of the mediastinum or mediastinitis, not great. So we have water soluble gastrographin, which people can swallow instead. So you want a gastrographin study, not a barium swallow study. Now, I can't get one of these except on Monday through Friday from 9 to 3. 
So if you happen to be in one of those places that can't get a swallow study, you can have them uh, swallow some contrast and get a CT scan or an X-ray with some sort of contrast that will show up as long as it's not barium. Oh, and in case you're curious, this is what they do. It's kind of very similar to a stent. They put this little tube through there and they um, stretch out your esophagus and they open it up. And usually if you've had to have it stretched before, you have to get it done every couple of years. Next is Borhoff's. Everybody talks about Borhoff's and how crazy it is, but the most common cause of a perforated esophagus is iatrogenic. Do you know what iatrogenic means? It means we caused it. It means that somebody got like an endoscope or some kind of medical procedure and we accidentally punctured your esophagus. So this is one of those things where you need to consult surgery immediately. Usually it's GI, but sometimes um, it's just general trauma surgery. Borhoff's used to be uh, caused by after you're done vomiting, like an alcoholic who's been vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. But you have to vomit quite a lot to rip your own esophagus. So usually this is more commonly seen after some kind of medical procedure. I want you to notice in these chest x-rays a couple of the different findings. And then of course there's the CT. But look at this chest x-ray up here. What you're seeing is that some of the black air surrounding the heart that's a bad sign. And then you're also seeing all this cloudy crap in the periphery. That is how much air and crepitus there is in the skin. So there is lots of air and crepitus in the skin on the outside of this patient. Because it's outside the chest wall, we know that it's in the periphery or in the skin. And that means that it's either the biggest pneumothorax you've ever seen, or it's a perforated esophagus. And that's a big deal. The uh, picture that has all the words over it um, over here has these handy dandy little arrows that show you, you can see air in between the pericardium and the heart. And that's what that little line is showing you. That is also an example of Warhoff syndrome. And finally, the CT scan, where you can see the black arrows are pointing to the black air around the heart and there shouldn't be. Um, be careful because you can have air that pushes on the heart that causes tamponade and they do have a triad that goes with it, even though we don't see the triad very commonly. Antibiotics are recommended, but only if you were swallowing something at the time. The important part is making these people MPO and getting surgery on board immediately. Um, there is a difference between Borhoff syndrome and Mallory Weiss. Um, Mallory Weiss is way more common. Mallory Weiss are tiny little stretches where stress tears in the esophagus, and it can be the cause of vomiting up little tiny bits of blood, especially in people like alcoholics or bulimics who are vomiting quite a bit. Um, and Borhoff syndrome is a complete tear, whereas Mallory Weiss is only one or two layers. Now let's talk a little bit about bleeding. A post-op tonsillectomy bleed. So it's most common within post-op day three to five. That's really important to know because it's been a couple days and you're like, how bad could it be? And if you're looking at this picture with me, you see this white area. That's actually the burned flesh from when they cut off the tonsil, they actually burn it off. So that is not pus. That is actually burned tissue. What we care about in this particular picture are the little spots of blood. Now I know you're looking at me and you're like, these are little tiny spots of blood. This is not an emergency, go home. However, remember what we said about peritonsillar abscesses and how we have to be careful about what's right behind the tonsil. That is the carotid. So these tiny little dots are sentinel bleeds. They're telling us that this tissue is soft and friable and easily bleeding. 
And could it just be from the burning off of the tonsil? Absolutely. But could it be an indication that they cut just a millimeter too deep and pretty soon, boom, that carotid is going to bleed all over you and this person's going to bleed out in front of you in less than four minutes? Absolutely. This is a big deal. ENT doctors who have done this, especially within the three to five day range, are going to run to your ER if you tell them is there is actual blood spots in the back of the throat. Now, remember, you need to actually look. You can't just take the patient's word for it. But if you see a big old blood clot or you see a whole bunch of blood spots back there, don't push on it. Don't try to do anything. Just go call ENT. Because if that breaks loose and the carotid bleeds, there's nothing we can do to save them. That's why when people tell you, oh, just get a Q-tip and put some pressure on it. Don't you do that. If you want to spray that down in the back with Epi, you're absolutely welcome to do that. But otherwise, you just leave them alone. Call ENT. This is a big deal, right? You don't want to necessarily do any attempts. You don't want to do anything. Call them. The other big sentinel bleed that you need to know about is a trach bleed. And I'm not talking about any trach having blood. I'm talking about a brand new trach within the first two weeks, okay? So no, this is a brand new trach in the first two weeks. And here is a picture of the trach. You can see that the trach is in the trachea. And there is a blood vessel right here called the tracheonominate artery. Um, it also has a couple other names, like the mammillary artery. But that blood vessel is really close to the aorta. And it's also really close to the trachea. And if that balloon is blown up just a little bit too much, or if due to the scar tissue, it grows together or whatever happens, it can bleed. And a lot of times it's just a little couple of spots. They cough it up and it's just a few spots. It doesn't look like a big deal, but it is a big deal. I have personally seen one of these. These, it's just a tiny little bleed. ENT did not want to come in. And then all of a sudden they're gushing with every beat of their heart, the entire body's blood out of their trachea. And this gets crazy fast. I'm telling you, you don't have time to do anything else. And they teach you in medical school, and I'm teaching you now, that what you do is you put your finger in the hole and you push on that artery and you shove it against the sternum so that way you stop the bleeding. However, as demonstrated in this beautiful picture, you have to intubate them from above because obviously if you put a finger in their trach hole, they can't breathe. If this happens suddenly and you haven't intubated them, you get the choice of putting your finger in and stopping the blood, but asphyxiating them or trying to intubate them and hoping they don't bleed out. This is a terrible situation to be in and unfortunately, I know what it's like. And you're really trying to decide both and you don't have time. One of the other ways that you can do this is you can put reinsert the trach back into um, the trachea and overinflate the cuff on purpose, pushing like your finger that inflated balloon towards the sternum. Now you can't leave this like that for a long time, obviously, but you can try to do that and see if it will work. If none of these things work, you have probably about 30 to 30 seconds to 70 seconds to save this patient's life. Otherwise they're gonna bleed out and die. I'm not kidding you with this. Please, please, please. If you have a sentinel post-op tonsillectomy bleed, or a sentinel trach, brand new trach bleed. We're not talking about it being present in for years. We're talking about a brand new trach. Please call ENT and maybe anesthesia and let your attendings know and be worried. All right, now for a quick review, 
These are all the things that we talked about with ear emergencies. Let's do a quick case. All right, so important things I want you to notice. So she's had two weeks of right ear pain and she already got polymyxin drops for otitis media, but she thinks it's getting worse despite the, drop, the, the antibiotics and it's now hurting her to chew. Plus she's having drainage out of her ear and she's having ringing and headaches. What do you think is going on with this lady? So a couple of things on this case. The first is that we already know that the eardrops didn't work and we're having drainage. I think she has necrotizing otitis externa. Even though that ear didn't look that bad, remember she's been on some antibiotics. What, do, what is the appropriate treatment? If you remember from what we talked about, you can't use drops, right? We have to use oral meds. So you, we need some oral or IV antibiotics. Why does a young, healthy 37-year-old have necrotizing otitis externa? Didn't I tell you it was only elderly and diabetics? The answer is she had lupus, remember? And lupus is usually treated with steroids and steroids make somebody immunocompromised. So she is immunocompromised and that's why she has necrotizing otitis externa. So why didn't the polymyxin drops work? It's because they were drops and we're not supposed to use drops, duh. Why did she feel this in her jaw and with chewing? The answer is because that facial nerve goes right back to the uh, ear and the teeth. And if you have problems like swelling due to necrotizing otitis externa, that swelling pushes on those nerves that go eventually out to the jaw and to the teeth. And that's why she felt jaw pain and pain with chewing. There's a lot of writing. Sorry about this, you guys. All right, let's do another case. All right. So first thing that you need to notice is that she's on anticoagulation and she's been bleeding for two hours and she's feeling dizzy and she's got a tachycardic heart rate. Those are all important. So let's do some questions. What are our next steps? First thing is we need to hold pressure, right? So we're gonna do some pressure holding and then when that doesn't work, we're gonna go ahead and get some Afrin and we're gonna spray it all up in there. I use, usually spray it in there and use like half the bottle. I use both nostrils and I just squirt it all over the place. If that doesn't work, then we're gonna probably have to get a Rhino Rocket and we're gonna soak it in Afrin and we're gonna soak it in TXA and we're gonna put a bunch of it in there. Now, hopefully, once we put in the Rhino Rocket, it'll stop, but we'll check it in 30 minutes and then we'll take it out and see if it stopped. And if it didn't, we'll have to put it back in and then proceed from there. Now, the nurse wants us to know if there's, if we want any IV or labs. Now, because we know this patient is on warfarin, we need to get an INR because we need to know what her bleeding rate is. And getting an IV on this patient is probably really good because she was dizzy and tachycardic. So maybe we give her a bolus or maybe we should just go ahead and get a CBC and see how much blood she's lost. 
Now, if we find out that her INR is three, do we reverse it? So technically, while this can be a life-threatening bleed, the answer is no, unless her INR is over 10. So we can correct this, we can give her blood, all that kind of stuff, but we do not need to reverse this INR of just barely three. Now, after we have failed a bunch of times and we finally get a rail-placed rhino rocket, what do we do next? So since we've pulled it out and put it in a couple of times, we send her home with the rhino rocket and we have her follow up in 24 hours. If she can't follow up with her ENT in 24 hours, she comes back to the ER where we'll repeat her INR and we'll take out the rhino rocket. Do we need to send her home with prophylaxis? If you remember from before, as long as she comes back in 24 hours, the answer is no. If she is longer than two or three days, then the answer is yes. So it's about how compliant the patient is and making sure you educate, educate, educate on why that rhino rocket needs to come out. A lot of patients will take those rhino rockets out at home, even against your medical advice, and it's okay as long as the blood is stopped. All right, let's do our last case. All right, so just to make you extra hungry, carne asada, in case you don't know what it is, is this beautiful, beautiful piece of meat right here. I'm sorry if you're a vegetarian, but OMG, carne asada is so delicious, highly recommended. Anyway, this gentleman was eating some, didn't bring me any, very rude. And now he got it stuck in his throat. He says he can't keep down water or his pills. So that's pretty significant because we're gonna test this, right? So part of our exam is I'm gonna bring him in a little piece of um, water or a little cup of water and he needs to drink it. And I need to see that he cannot swallow water. So the most likely diagnosis is a food bolus, especially if he can't swallow the water or his pills. And on exam, we're expecting him to be able to hold the water down, complete the swallow, for about 10 to 15 seconds, and then the water to come right back up, completely undigested. The student for the day asks you about ordering an x-ray. Is that appropriate? The answer in this particular case is no. Unless we're suspecting that there's a piece of bone, and by the way, by definition, carne asada does not have bones in it, there is no point in ordering an x-ray. Food, especially meat, will not show up on an x-ray because meat is essentially your muscles, right? And your muscles don't show up on x-ray. So unless you're suspicious of something like a child swallowing a plastic toy or a piece of chicken bone, do not order an x-ray. So when we call ENT, they expect us to have tried something already. What was it? The answer was glucagon, right? They really like glucagon, even though I really haven't seen it work before, but you know, I'm willing to try it. I'm, I'm willing to be wrong. So be sure that you've already tried glucagon before you call ENT because they'll be cranky about it. Once glucagon doesn't work, what other therapies can we try? The answer is things like trying a little bit of Coca-Cola and just like letting it sit, trying to digest things. Also nitroglycerin or magnesium. If those don't work, obviously you still need to call your ENT or your GI. 
And to end this lecture, I just wanted to add a few recommended resources. If you don't already know about the EMRA in a biotic guide, these are other books that are really useful. These two are very small and they really help with differentials. I believe they're on their recommended, your recommended book list. They fit in your pocket and they really help you not forget the emergencies of every chief complaint. Also, in case you're tired of hearing my voice, which I don't blame you at all, a free podcast that helps with EM is EM Basic. It's been out for a little while, but it's full of tons of basic topics that can really help you in the emergency room. So if you need a source and you like podcasts, definitely consider EM Basic. I would also say there's one called EM Clerkship that I would also highly recommend. And for those of you out there who are more experienced and you're interested in ER medical malpractice insights, this website has a really good newsletter that comes out once a month with real malpractice cases, what was said, and what we can learn from them. And that's a wrap for today. I hope you learned something and thank you so, so much.